Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This episode of Know How is brought to you by SmartThings. SmartThings lets you monitor, control, and automate your home from wherever you are using your smartphone. Right now, SmartThings is offering Know How listeners 10% off any home security or solutions kit, and you get free shipping in the United States when you go to smartthings.com slash twit and use the offer code twit at checkout. Today, it's Nats, DMZs, quadcopters, and other letters. Letters? Yep. Welcome to Know How. It's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burdett. And for the next 45, 30, yeah, give or take. 50, 90 minutes, we're going to yeah. be talking about some of the projects that we've been playing with over the last few weeks so you can take them home and geek out on your own time. That's right. These are the things that have interested us over the last couple of weeks, and this last story actually kind of just frightens me. It's yeah. cool, but it frightens me. Yeah, you know, there's every once in a while we, we stumble upon a project that's like, oh, yeah, that's really cool, and then yeah. a second later, that's <laughs> terrifying. That's the possibilities no bueno. oh. are... And so if you're wondering what that is, is um, uh, there's car hacking. Uh, what was, what's the name of the kid? Yeah, the name of the kid is Eric Evanchik. Mm. And uh, so I think he used to work for Tesla. Yeah, he uh, was like an intern or something. Right, smart kid, smart kid. And what he's done is he's created an inexpensive device. It's going to run between $60 and $100 that interfaces with the OBD2 port. That's the onboard diagnostic port in your car. Right. Which connects to the CAN. That's the controller area network. Right, So that's right. everything that's connected in your car, which in a modern car is yeah. everything. I mean, yeah, the la uh, every car in the last two decades has this system. Exactly, and it controls braking, it controls the engine, it controls the entertainment system, the yeah. lighting. B basically, anything that does something in your car that requires the input of a computer is connected to the CAN, to the CAN. Right. So he's created a device that will plug into the OBD2 port on your car, and the other side has a USB port that plugs into your PC, and it gives you access to everything. <laughs> now, you've been able to get access to the OBD2 before, but this is just something that allows it to translate into more usable, hackable exactly. uh, code. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the OBD2 port, it's always been there. I mean, yeah. anyone who's messed around with cars has probably found it. In fact, there's been a lot of aftermarket car parts that will utilize the OBD2 to like advance timing right. or to, to mess with the performance of the engine. Or uh, take off that speed limiter that might be there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or even, you know, like for example, mine, I just use it so that I have a separate screen that will log RPM and engine temps. Right. I think so, we talked, there's a little dongle that yeah. you had for BYB that would log the miles and things mm -hmm. like, and your emissions and things like that. Right. So it's a useful port. It's not like it's, it's an exploit. No. But yeah, it's an exploit. But it, it was designed in an era where they didn't think of encryption or there's no password or anything like that to get no, access to no, that it's, stuff. No, it's pure. Now, the one difficulty has been that the, the language that the OBD2 port speaks is kind of cryptic. You know, mm -hmm. it really was designed for diagnostics. But what this dongle does, this thing that he's created, is it converts it into a programming language that basically any hacker can figure out. Right. Now, that's cool. This is actually designed to be a tool, again, so that you can look at the, in, the inner workings of your car. He says he wants it to, to inspire the next generation of car hackers mm -hmm. who will do things like change engine timing to increase performance or increase uh, economy, yeah. uh, you know, uh, allow you to, to interface the entertainment system with other pieces of technology. The problem is <laughs> this is so incredibly easily abused. Uh, essentially, right. anyone who has physical access to your car and that's Which anyone, unless you have your car in a vault. Right, it wouldn't be too difficult. It wouldn't be too difficult. Uh, all you'd have to do is you know, get, get inside, plug this thing in, 
and you can reprogram someone's CAN. And if you reprogram their CAN, you can make the car react any way you want it to react. And with some cars, you don't even need to get ac physical access to the system. Yeah, we actually covered that story a while back. There's that a was, BMW uh, story. Yeah, the connected drive? I think that's I think what, it was, what called, it was called. Something yeah. like that. But it was like they were able to get into the system through the entertainment software. Yeah, it, which, <laughs> which again doors. is connected to the CAN. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to get into this era where manufacturers are going to have to figure that they need to, as you mentioned downstairs, air gap. There's <laughs> got to be an air gap somewhere. Somewhere that you can say, you know what? I don't need any access to the computer that controls braking yeah. or the engine. Right. So let's put that aside, unless like <laughs> I do something like a physical key or a plug that has to be connected that's in a secure area. Right. Because otherwise, if you've got something like connected drive and it's not protected and it's really easy to get into, someone could rewrite your car as you're driving. I know. That would well, be so not good. Well, it's like from my own experience using the Raspberry Pi or something like that, I'd love to be able to mess around with all the options, but sometimes it's like, oh, I should have done plus one instead of minus <laughs> one, and now my brakes don't work. I know. Oops. <laughs> yeah, with a Raspberry Pi, it's like, oh, it doesn't work. I guess right. I'll have to reinstall the OS. With a yeah. car, you can't go, oh, wow, my brakes make the car go faster. Okay, I look. should probably troubleshoot this in the next iteration. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Let me just uh, hook that up real <laughs> quick while I'm driving on the freeway. So, uh, yeah, uh, don't panic. This is not no. a cause for mass hysteria. It, it actually is really cool because we are DIYers, we're makers, and anytime someone releases tech like this, it does open up options. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully the car industry will, will figure out quickly that they're no longer building cars, they're building computers that have engines and wheels. Yeah. Well, you know, it's... I love this technology. I love the idea of being able to um, tinker with the the, equip the hardware that I own. But we are in a kind of wild west era where our you know yeah. things aren't as secure as they should be, and it's something that like car manufacturers are going to have to think about uh, definitely way more, especially as we get into the time of uh, driving driverless right. cars and things like that. I will say, I don't have this device, but I, I have. I did play around a lot with OBD2 when I was living in mm -hmm. San Jose, and um, I managed to interface it with my laptop, and it was very cool yeah. late at night when it was raining to be able to flick off ABS and all the stability control <laughs> and just, <laughs> just go crazy. Because you, you can't do that when that stuff's on. No, so, no, you know, your traction control yeah. and so stability. So it was literally like, like you know, Du, 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 click. Do, do. Okay, we're good. And then yeah. reset it when you're done. So right. just don't forget to reset <laughs> it, <laughs> or or let someone borrow your car for a little bit. Like. I, I, and I have to say, you know, because I was driving a rear wheel, a front engine rear wheel drive car at the mm -hmm. time, the amount of power that is on a modern vehicle is uncontrollable without the computer assist. Oh yeah. I mean, because if you try to drive a car the way that you drive the car with it has all its computers on, you will put it out of control. Yeah, so it, it really makes you appreciate how much the computer is doing to make you not die. Yeah. Well, it's good to have that appreciation. But uh, yeah, please let me know if you if, yeah. before you do it. All right. Let's go. Let's go for a ride. All right. Now let's get away from cars because what we want to talk about is networking. Specifically, we had a question from the member of a member of the audience in the uh, the Google Plus group. Uh, Brian, you want to take that? Yeah. This comes from Mikael Edisvag. Uh, but he's, he wants to know, he wants to segment his network. I want to seg segment off my home network, but I cannot change my router to my current one. Does, <laughs> does not support any features to do that. Some of my colleagues suggest a NAT NAT, nat a NAT, NAT on NAT. NAT on hmm. NAT on NAT. A firewall OS and a switch slash router that supports VLANs. To me, this sounds very complicated. Is there an easier way of segmenting my network? Just to be clear, I want two networks to communicate with each other. That do not. Do not. That do not connect with each with. other. Yes. Um, so you're talking about a NAT on a NAT, and that's actually that's, not as dirty as it sounds. It sounds bad. It sounds bad. It's We don't like it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, it's not an ideal situation, but it's something that you can do okay. if you don't have more advanced gear. I'm going to give you two different options. I'm going to give you that NAT on NAT, and then I'm going to give you a VLAN option, which uh, we're going to go into it a bit more in depth. But before we do that, there's something you need to understand about IP addressing. Now, Brian, you, hmm. you know about how IP addressing works, right? The, right. the IP address we have on the internet. It's a unique number. It yes. belongs to you. It's like an address, a phone number, something right. that if a server pings, you know, 143 dot blah, 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 dot, it's, a, it's four octets, hmm. that it will get to you. That's, yeah, that's your outside address. That's your outside address. 
Those are called routable addresses, an IPv4. <laughs> IPv6 works the same way, but it's much longer. Uh, right, because they needed more more addresses for more yeah, people. Yeah, right? IPv6 has more combinations than there are molecules on the planet Earth or something like that. It's it's a ridiculous amount. Okay, I mean, seriously. So we shouldn't have to worry about running out of any soon. Of IPv6, okay. we're already out of IPv4. Right. Uh, but IPv4 is what. Network geeks have been using for the longest time. It's the easiest to to visualize, so that's what we're going to use for this okay, demonstration. Cool. Now, there's a difference between what are called routable addresses mm -hmm. and non-routable addresses. Okay. Uh, so in the beginning, everything was routable. And the idea was you had uh, you had four octets, uh, which I can't remember exactly how many. What the, it's, it was 32 bit something like, something like oh. that. It was a lot of combinations. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> but in the in the 90s, we started to realize that we were running out of space. <laughs> so already, the 90s was kind of a long time ago right. now. <laughs> but then we came up with this wonderful thing that we called NAT, Network okay. Address Translation, because some network engineers figured out, wait a minute, not every device that's Needs on a network. Needs its own uh, routing address. Exactly. Does it need its own address? Because we don't want the outside world to communicate with it. Right. So we came, we came up with these boxes that did what's called network address translation. And it allowed us to take a single routable address and share it among a lot of devices. And that would be your local That would be your local your network. LAN. Yes, but for that to work, they needed to come up they 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 broke off a chunk of the usable addresses and they made them non-routable addresses. Uh, okay. So anything that is 192.168.0.0/16 slash so that's 65,536 possible uh, combinations. 172.16.0.0 up to 172.31.0.x.x uh, uh, right. slash 20. So that's like a million something. Right. Uh, on then 10.0.0.0 slash 24, that's all of it. Anything that starts with 10. <laughs> all of those addresses are now non-routable. But what it means is that I can reuse these over and over again every time I go behind a NAT. I was going to say the 192.168, that Sounds is very really familiar. familiar yes. right? yeah. <laughs> we, every device that you buy in the consumer market is probably going to start with 192.168.0.1 yeah. or 1.1. Yeah, that's, that's like the default default. Linksys router, everything right. there. But the important part is any of those devices can use any of these numbers, all of these non-routable addresses. And like I said, if I have two different routers, they can both use the exact same number because those are non-routable addresses. They don't have to be unique. As long as those numbers don't translate out of the box, mm -hmm. it's fine. Everything works fine. Okay. Does so that there's make no sense? Con yeah, there's no conflict then? No. There's no conflict, right. Okay. Which, which freed up. That's why even though we were running out of addresses in the 90s, yeah. we didn't actually run out of addresses until the 2010s. And that's because when we started natting off the devices that didn't need a real address, right. it saved us a lot of space. Makes sense. Makes sense, right? Okay. Okay, now. Now that we know that, let's take a look at this. <laughs> this is what he's, I'm not even going to try to say your last name. Uh, we're just going to call you Mikhail. <laughs> Emmy. We're going to call you Emmy. Yeah. So Emmy is suggesting this. You've got the internet, then you've got a router, mm -hmm. and then you've got a NAT, a NAT, and a NAT. And now these other NATs are these other individual routers? Or? Right. So what I'm doing is I'm having the internet, I'm having my cable modem slash router, whatever it's going to be. I'm okay. assuming that this is, this is a home network. And I'm going to use multiple NATs, each using a unique non-routable IP address right. as, as its range. Okay. Right? So this might be 192.168.0.1. Mm -hmm. This is .0.2, uh, .1.1, .1, mm -hmm. .2.1, uh, .3.1. Okay. Right? So they, you know, I mean, I could use the same for all of this, yeah. but to make it simpler for us to, to keep see, track, yeah. Right. I'm going to use different addresses. Now, here's the, here's the fun part. He doesn't want these networks to talk to each other. This network will not actually be able to talk to this network mm -hmm. or this network and vice versa. So anything on the same level cannot speak to the other uh, routers, the other NATs on that, that box. They but can only speak to a single address. To the single address that's connected to the right. internet. Okay. But anything in one of these NATs can address any device that's in that NAT and can address any device that's in the internet. Okay, okay. It just can't see the other NATs that are on the network. Right, okay. that, that are on the same level. So, for example, right. if I had multiple of these, these, these are my favorite. These mm -hmm. are the old standard. This is a WRT54G. Yep. That's a classic. This is a classic. As you can see, it's got the fun. This was the, f I was an original fonero. <laughs> Is that what they call you? The, yes, I would say Fonero. Oh. Oh. Uh, it was the, the idea was to share your, your internet, right? You, right. So you would, you, they actually, they, 
So they had a program where they would send you a free router, uh -huh. and I got like 12. <laughs> <laughs> and did, did you use them for your oh, individual yeah. yeah, NATs that you this, needed? Yeah, this is the thing. So what I can do is I can take this and this, and I can put this on the same network. And being on the same network, uh, uh, both being NATs of NATs, they can only see one address, the, the WAN address, from, from the other device. Okay. So the, the devices within each of these NATs would actually be protected unless right. I did port forwarding or DMZ or something like that. Okay. okay. Is, is this making sense? This is making sense. I, I feel like it's a little bit of NATception, but... It is NATception, and this is, a, this is not... I would not do this. No. This but is, if you wanted to do a home network where you had computers on separate NATs, this and, is the way you right, would do it. And you wanted a simple way to do it, and you had a bunch of leftover routers. This is... The, you can do this. It's not preferred because when you NAT a NAT you start to run into performance issues uh, and you can misconfigure things and make things bad. Well the nightmare I always run into is the my gaming machines so like any Xboxes or Playstations connected to the internet I always have issues with the NAT and it being open or uh, strict. Right, right. Uh, 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 essentially can you do this? Yes. Okay. Should you do it? No. Really is the concern, I guess the concern is that if you had an infected computer on your network, you wouldn't want that getting transferred right. to any of the other computers? So in this example, if... Uh, let me go to this side. In this example, if this was like the public network uh, that had the Wi-Fi spots and everything, right. and there was an infection over here, that computer could see this and could see that and would be able to see the WAN address mm -hmm. of this NAT, but, it, but wouldn't actually be able to see any of the devices behind it. So it's like car... car uh, it's Carp a firewall. You're, a you're, firewall. You're creating a firewall, right. I was thinking like the Titanic. Carpe Car I can't think uh, of the word. The compartments, watertight compartments. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Compart yeah. Ma making compartments of yeah. your network. Exactly. Right. Now, uh, this is, as people in the chat room are pointing out, this is double natting, mm -hmm. uh, and we don't like doing that because it means your network address translating a network address translation. Hmm. Don't like that. That hmm. don't, don't do that. And that's when things start not talking to each other and stuff? Well, I mean, it'll work, but tends to start slowing down and mm. you lose things and just no just don't okay. do it i mean it it'll work yeah don't do it it's 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 really if if, if it's a short time thing uh -huh. great if not then don't do it and actually let me show you a way i'm sorry alex did you do you have this computer yes. 11 okay so really quickly this is i'm not going to show you how to do it until next week but if you go in if you have a a a, a, a router that can run DDWRT. One of the cool things about this is that it does what's called VLANs, and uh, and yeah, and ME actually did mention that VLANs were one of the possible solutions. Uh, and VLANs are incredibly powerful. So virtual, uh, le a, a local area networks. Right. Right. Uh, essentially, it allows you to take the same cable. So rather than bodging all this and putting a NAT on a NAT on a NAT, yeah. If you have a VLAN capable router or VLAN capable switches, it allows you to separate your networks without having to run multiple cables and put multiple NATs. Or get, yeah, have to buy more routers. Exactly, <clears throat> and it's, it's incredibly powerful. Uh, what I've got here is I've got a little bit of a video that's gonna show you in broad strokes what a VLAN can do. So uh, Alex, could you push that magic button? We've got a really good demonstration, a really simple demonstration of how this works. Now explain to me, what do we have on the table? We have these IntelliJacks, mm -hmm. which, by the way, I have to add, these are some of my favorite uh, pieces of gear to come out of Interop. These are essentially power over Ethernet powered managed switches. But why do we have four of them on the table? What are they doing? So we just kind of set up a real simple configuration here to help show people what VLANs are about, show you guys what this is all about. And so pretend this is a, a regular switch that's in your environment, 24-port switch, 48-port switch, whatever it might be. Pretend this is another one. And then these two over here, we just use them as end stations. Pretend those are laptops or what have you. We just use those as a device that we can ping to to verify that connectivity. So again, very simple configuration of two switches and two end devices. And we've essentially got two VLANs going across here <laughs> VLAN 11 and a VLAN 12, and we're going to show you how these VLANs keep that separated. So the, the originating laptop over there can't, can see one VLAN, but can't see the other VLAN. Right. And that's what you're seeing right now on this feed, and that is uh, it's got two windows. One is trying to ping this device, one's trying to ping this device, and as you can see, traffic is only getting through on one of these, these command shells. And the reason for that is that uh, we have set these up so that Port 1 and Port 2 have the same, on this switch, have the same VLANs as Port 1 and Port 2 on that switch. 
which essentially means that with this one cable, I've created two isolated networks. The traffic doesn't flow between them. That's absolutely correct. Yep. So to further that just a little bit, this, this uh, port number one here is VLAN 11. This port number one here is VLAN 11. Number two here is VLAN 12. Number two here is VLAN 12. But on the back, this, this purple cable goes straight from here into the back of this switch, and, for, and that, that cable has both VLANs, and that's VLAN tagged with 802.1Q, and 802.1Q is the, is the technology or the standard used to tag the, the VLANs. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and switch this cable over to port 2, and in a second, because it's got a, it's got a dump, the ARP cache, Correct. in a second I should start to see pings off of that second IntelliJack, but tell me, how does the tagging work? But where did the tags start, where do they end, and how do they run through my network? Sure. So the, uh, most of your end workstations and servers typically aren't going to send out a, a, a tag on a packet. They have the capability these days, but typically they're not. And so the packet's going to come into, let's say in this situation, port 2, it's going to be untagged. So the switch is going to receive that packet with no tag on it. It's going to look at it and say, well, that port's only in VLAN 12. So immediately, any packet coming into a switch, and even a blank switch that has no configuration on it, essentially what they do is they tag the packet as it traverses the switch. So the, so the switch can keep an eye on where that packet uh, is supposed to live. So again, it comes in, immediately the switch tags the packet with VLAN 12, and then again, it sends it out the back here with that 802.1Q tag on it with VLAN 12 in that, in that 802.1Q tag. Now, we can see on the screen that we've flopped. So now I can access the other IntelliJack, but that first IntelliJack is no longer pingable. If that's all it was, that wouldn't be that impressive. I can actually start grouping together VLANs. I can actually start grouping together ports into particular network zones. Show me how I do that on this interface and tell me why I'd want to do that. Sure. So uh, in our example here, as you look at the screen, you can see that on port one. And again, we're looking at switch number two here. Uh, and, and port number one on that has a what's called a PVID of 11. And port number two has a PVID of, of 12. And what the PVID is, is it says, if I receive a packet and I don't know what VLAN should I put that on. And so the PVID says, well, if you, don't, if you receive a packet that doesn't have a VLAN tag on it, put it on this VLAN. And in this situation, we're putting it on 11 or we're putting it on 12 for port 2. So um, that's what we're doing. You want me to go ahead and do the Go, ahead, go okay. and do the honors. All right, so here we go. So what, now what we're going to do is we're going to be able to make that laptop be able to ping both of these end devices. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to uh, switch, switch port 2 here to, uh, to 11, to, to VLAN 11. All right, so here we go. We're going to hit that. That's going to apply it. And now, we need to switch this back over to port one Very because good. that's where we've added the VLAN. Exactly. So in a couple of seconds, again, after it's dumped out its ARP cache, it should show us that it can now ping both the devices. That is correct. And there, and there we, we go. go. Just now we've got, back. we've got both feeds so that one port is now able to see the traffic on both of these switches, right. on, on both of these ports. Now, this is a very small demonstration, but hopefully it shows you the power of a VLAN and it, it, it hopefully it inspires you to go out and play. Because again, the best place for you to find out more about VLANs is to get some gear that speaks VLANs and just start playing with it. Start assigning VLANs, you know, make a few mistakes, reset the gear, find out how to use them and find out how they can benefit you in, in your network endeavors. Now, we, uh, we are not going to show you how to load DDWRT onto your router of choice because we actually did that. Well, not uh, we did that. The original Know How crew did that back in episode three. So if you go to episode three of Know How, it's Ayaz and uh, Leo, and they actually give you step-by-step -step instructions for finding the firmware for your router yeah. and loading it on. Now, yeah. what we will do next week is we will show you some of the different options because it's not just DDWRT. There's also Tomato mm -hmm. and OpenWRT. Those are also good options. We're going to go back and forth on some of the pros and cons of each one. And then we're actually going to show you how you would do VLANs inside a DDWRT equipped router. Cool, cool, yeah. yeah. Even though episode three was whew, a while ago, ago. <laughs> I mean, the process really hasn't changed, so. Yeah, no, it, it, I mean, really, if you've ever upgraded the firmware on your router, this is exactly the same thing. The only difference is what, what you'll hear is a 30-30-30, and we'll explain what a 30-30-30 is next week. Uh, that's the thing that holds people up sometimes, but mm -hmm. uh, seriously, if you've got a DDWRT a capable router and you're not using a custom firmware, 
you are wasting the hardware. You're it, missing out. You just, There's you so just much really are. fun things you can play with. Yeah. Mix and match. And, and that's what we'll be doing over the next couple of weeks. We're going to sh show you some of the more advanced features because it's not just VLANs. You can do things to the wireless and yeah. some fantastic things to the wireless. We're going to show you some of the pros and cons of messing around with the wireless settings. <laughs> we're going to show you how you can install your own open VPN if you want to run a VPN out of your house. And we're going to show you how to use static routes, which believe it, it's it's actually incredibly incredibly uh, robust. If you've ever wanted to do enterprise style networking, but you didn't want to buy enterprise priced gear, mm -hmm. you'll be able to do it with custom firmware. Or you just wanted to open up some ports to a certain IP address so you can play games uh, no, without won't work. a strict net. No, 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 no. The only way for you to play your Xbox is to hook it directly up to the internet. <laughs> just DMZ that. Just DMZ. Yeah, don't worry about it. Actually, we're going to be talking a little about DMZ in in just a bit, but okay. first. Let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the sponsor of this episode of Know How. Now, you know that Brian and I are big fans of the connected home. We are. We, we are. are. I mean, everything should be connected, right? I mean, we're not talking about just my computer, or my lights, or my camera. I'm talking about my thermostat, my entertainment system, my sound mm -hmm. system, my appliances, my lights. They, in this kind of, don't you kind of expect? I mean, what they yes. promised us way back when. <laughs> we should all have houses that are like Iron Man's Jarvis. That's right. I want my garage door to open when I roll up into the driveway. I want to know everything that's going on, and I want to be able to keep my eye on Tibbs, my little, my dog. Oh, little yeah. Turbs. Well. The thing is, that technology kind of exists, but they're so jumbled. There's so many different manufacturers that offer this thing or mm -hmm. that thing or, or that light switch I really want and this humidity sensor that I, I would really like to install, but there's no really good way to combine everything. Oh, but there is. Oh, but there is. Smart things. <laughs> now, what is smart things? Smart things was CES 2015's most valued product in the home automation uh, sector. This thing is not just a home automation system. It's a way to connect all hub. your devices. Now, it starts with that. That's the hub. This is the device that's going to allow you to connect multiple devices no matter what you're using. Do you want to use your smart home with your Sonos sound system? Sure. How about your Nest thermostat? You could do that. What about your drop cams? Of course. Now, the thing is, it's not just connecting them, it's giving it the smarts. So you could use something like the moisture sensor under the house so that it turns on a pump when mm -hmm. there's water in the basement. It could use something like the open and close sensors to, to control security so that you'll know if someone's entering your house. My personal favorite, you could use this. That's the present sensor. What? So when you walk near your house, it knows that it's you and it sets everything to your settings. Yep, I have it where, or I would have it, is uh, turn on my lights when I come walking through the door. Right, yeah. and for me, I have it turn on the lights. I have it turn down the temperature to the, the temperature that I like. Cause I <laughs> turn like, down the temperature. I turn turn yeah. down the temperature. I'm, I like it cold. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm a cold guy. Got to keep cool. But also do things like turn on my Sono sound system. Mm -hmm. um, or And actually, it's also integrated with my drop cam. So if someone violates a boundary within the drop cam frame, I get a, a text warning saying, hey, there's there's a package for you. Or, hey, yep. someone's coming to the front door. Well, sometimes Shirley's will take my dog to her parents' house, but I still want my house to be protected, so I could hook up one of these to play a bark noise when it detects motion near the gate or something like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> and you can do it all with smart things. Now, smart things is CES 2015's highest place home automation system. It won the Editor's Choice Award. Now, you don't have just lights, locks, thermostats. You've got everything. And that's what smart things let you do. It lets you control everything with intuitive controls that lets you set the rules on your smartphone through their free iOS, Android, and Windows phone app. Now, with smart things, you can customize the way that your smart devices talk to each other. Just like Brian and I just said, make your house react the way you want it to. It becomes your own personal Jarvis. You can set your lamps to brighten each morning at sunrise or when you want to wake up. You can protect your things with home security, motion detection sensors, water detection sensors, and more. You can set the cameras to take a series of photos when unwanted motion or entry is detected. And you can have your doors recognize you when you walk up and have them unlock themselves. Welcome home, Brian. Welcome home. There are so <laughs> many different ways to customize your smart things home. Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to get started setting up your smart home right now. Smart Things is offering know-how listeners 10% off any home security or solutions kit, and you'll get free shipping in the United States when you go to smartthings.com slash twit and use the offer code twit at checkout. That's smartthings.com slash twit and use the offer code TWIT at checkout. Smart Things, your smart home. Now, Get we smart. thank Smart Things for their support of know-how.
Thank you, Smart Things. Thank you, Smart Things. Now, uh, Brian. What? <clears throat> we took two weeks off from uh, the <laughs> Alien X quadcopter build because we wanted to give people a chance to, to uh, catch up. To, to get, catch the parts, up, get the so parts so they could play along. Yeah, so they could play along. But uh, those two weeks have elapsed, and now it's uh, time to show them how to put it all together. Hey, Alex, Sweet. can you do me a favor? Push that magic button. <laughs> last installment of Project Alien X, we showed you the parts and tools that you'll need to build a stretched 450 class quadcopter. This time we're going to show you exactly how to build it. The first step in integration is mounting the motors on the Alien X's arms. Your frame kit should have included four arms in two different colors. Decide which arms will be forward and which ones will be aft. Now mark your arms from one to four, with one being the forward left, two being the forward right, three aft right, and four aft left. This is important if you're using motors that are threaded for clockwise and counterclockwise operation, and it's just good practice if you ever need to disassemble your Alien X. In our set of Emacs 2213 motors, the two red cap motors are threaded to turn counterclockwise, while the two black cap motors turn clockwise. If you have a similar set of rotation threaded motors, but are unsure of which way they are designed to operate, just remember that holding the prop nut while turning the motor in the direction it's supposed to turn will tighten the nut. Take arm number one and one of the motors that turns clockwise. Again, in our build, it's one of the black cap motors. Then mount the motor to the arm using four M3-0.58 millimeter machine screws. The length is important because six millimeter screws won't penetrate far enough into the motor housing and 10 millimeter screws will penetrate too far. Apply a very thin dab of Loctite glue on each screw to prevent them from vibrating loose. Repeat the process for all four arms. Arm number three gets the other black capped motor while arms two and four get the two rev capped counterclockwise turning motors. Now that the motors are mounted, let's get the electronic speed controllers installed. If you're using the Emacs 2213 we suggested, then you already have pre-soldered male 3.5 millimeter bullet connectors on the motors. However, our ready to fly quads red series 30 amp ESCs need female 3.5 millimeter bullet connectors on the motor leads and male 3.5 millimeter bullets on the power leads. I actually prefer to not have pre-soldered connectors on the ESCs because it allows us to cut the motor leads down to keep excess wire to a minimum. Thread your motor leads up through the lattice of the arms with their connectors ending up on the upper surface. Then place the ESC towards the rear of each arm and eyeball how much wire you can remove. Account for the length of the bullet connectors and be generous with slack. You can tie down a little excess wire, but if it's too short, you'll have to solder new wires. Measure twice and cut once, then repeat the process for all four ESCs. It's time to solder the connectors. Strip about four millimeters of insulation from the ends of the ESC's motor leads, tin your leads, then solder 3.5 millimeter female bullet connectors to each lead. The easiest way to attach the bullet connectors is by heating the bullets until you can flow solder inside the mounting cup. Fill the cup halfway with solder, then insert your pre tin lead. Allow the solder on the lead to reflow. Then remove heat and hold the wire in position until the solder cools. With the motor leads done, you can now solder male 3.5 millimeter bullet connectors onto the power leads of the ESCs using the same process that we use for the female connectors on the ESC motor leads. Double check your work. Look for empty mounting cups or obvious gaps between wires and solder. The heat shrink will hide bad joints, so it's best to take a second and third look now. Once you're satisfied with your soldering work, use lengths of 3 16 inch heat shrink tubing to insulate the connectors. For the female connectors, you want to cover everything from the end of the connector to a quarter inch past. For the male connectors, insulate everything from the rotating part of the bullet to a quarter inch past. Connect the motor leads to the leads on the ESCs and zip tie them to the far end of the arm, away from the motors. The ESC should be securely mounted to the arm, and I like using a second, smaller zip tie to secure the motor leads. But don't overly tighten the motor leads and don't zip tie the wires from the motors, as we may need to swap several of the connectors when we check motor rotation in the next segment. Set the arms aside and let's make a power harness. Our power harness starts with a 45 millimeter power distribution board from Ready to Fly Quads. Basically any power source you connect to the positive and negative leads on the inside of the board will be distributed to any devices that are connected to the positive and negative leads on the outside of the board. The board comes with soldering points for eight ESCs and three peripherals, but we're only going to use the four points towards the front and back of the board. Cut eight two-inch lengths of 14-gauge silicone wire, four black and four red. 
These will become the leads that go from the distribution board to the power leads on the ESCs. Also cut a pair of 5-inch lengths. These will become the wires that connect the power distribution board to the battery. Strip 4 millimeters of insulation off of each end of the 2-inch wires and tin each end. Now solder a female 3.5 millimeter bullet connector to the end of each of the 2-inch wires. Insulate each connector with heat shrink tubing as before. The 5 inch pair of wires will be connected to a female XT60 connector, a popular connector found on many LiPo battery packs. Soldering XT60 connectors can be a little tricky because too much heat will melt the plastic housing surrounding the XT60, warping the alignment of the conductors or destroying the connector altogether. I found that the easiest way to solder XT60 is to first plug the connector into its opposite to spread the heat and maintain alignment of its conductors. Insert your pre-stripped and tin leads into the correct cup. Note that the negative lead will always be on the side of the connector with the cut corners. Then apply heat to the wire, not the connector. When the solder on the pre-tin wire starts to flow, quickly apply solder to the wire and fill the cup. Never spend more than 8 seconds applying heat and make sure to let the XT60 cool before soldering the other wire. Once your wires are attached, use 3 16 inch heat shrink tubing to insulate the conductors. Now let's assemble the power distribution board, making sure to match the positive solder points to the red wires and the negative points to the black wires, solder each 2 inch lead to the board, making sure to use the front 2 and rear 2 contact sets for the ESC leads. Take the 5 inch leads and solder them into the contact points on the inside of the board. You can use either side of the board but you'll want all your wires mounted on the same side. It doesn't have to be pretty but try to avoid an excess of solder which risks a bridged connection a really bad thing when you're passing 50 to 100 amps through the board. With our leads in place and the boards checked for solder bridges, it's time to mount the power distribution board on the lower half of the frame. If you're wondering which plate is the lower half, the lower half is wider and longer than the top half. Using nylon spacers and the pre-drilled mounting holes, secure the board so that the solder points point up and the power leads point to the front and rear of the frame. If you have the spacers, you can also screw spacers on top of the board with a total height of 1.5 inches. This will allow you to secure the board to the top frame once the arms are installed, making your frame more rigid. Remembering the numbering of your arms, attach them to the bottom plate with two screws each. Pass the power leads through the arms and connect them to the leads from the power harness. Make sure not to flex the frame or put any undue pressure on it since it's relatively fragile until the top half of the frame is attached. Using the included screws, attach the top half of the frame to the arms. Once those are fastened, use four aluminum posts to complete the tail towards the rear of the frame. Zip tie your receiver to the tail and use the excess zip tie length to secure the receiver's antenna. Using more nylon spacers, mount the flight controller on the top deck, directly above the power distribution board. This is the center of gravity for your craft. I'm mounting the flight controller on the top deck because I'm using a KK 2.1.5 board and I want easy access to the screen and controls while tuning, but you can also mount your flight controller within the frame just above the power distribution board. Using the four included rubber dampeners, install the clean plate on the nose of the Alien X. This clean plate will allow you to mount GoPro style cameras on a surface that is somewhat isolated from the rest of the frame, reducing vibration while placing the camera in the nose of the craft. Now it's time to wire your flight controller. We're using a KK, so if you're using something else, you'll need to modify these instructions to fit your controller. The ESCs will be connected to the row of pins to the right of the KK, with the topmost set of pins for ESC1, the second set for ESC2, and so forth. The number of the ESC is the same as the arm number I had you mark earlier. When connecting the ESCs to the controller, make sure the ground wire, usually black, is to the outside of the board, while the positive wire is in the middle, and the signal cable, usually yellow or white, is on the inside. Most non-opto type ESCs include a battery eliminator circuit or BEC that provides 5 or 6 volts of power to the flight controller and the receiver from the main battery, but they can also fry electronics if incorrectly connected. Check and double check your connections before you apply power. Also, while the KK will only accept power from the first ESC, some flight controllers will fry if you connect them to more than one BEC equipped ESC. If you're using such a flight controller, snip the red center wire on ESCs other than the first. Your receiver should have a schematic for which pins are signal and which are power. Plug one of your servo leads into the receiver pins for channel 1, making sure to use the white or yellow wire for signal. Plug the other side of the lead into the topmost set of pins on the left side of the controller, 
with the white or yellow signal cable towards the inside of the KK. Take a second lead and connect it to just the signal pins of channels 2 through 4 on the receiver, then connect the other end of that lead to just the signal pins, the ones closest to the screen for channels 2 through 4 on the flight controller. Use the last lead to connect channel 5 from the receiver to the controller. RKK came with a small alarm that gives us audible information about arming status, voltage, and, if we crash in the weeds, location. On the top left side of the KK are two pins labeled buzzer. Connect the red lead to the positive pin and the black lead to the negative. Now for the moment of truth. We're going to connect power to the Alien X for the first time. Recheck your connections to make sure that you haven't cross-connected anything and make sure your props are not yet on the motors. Then, standing ready to remove power at the first hint of trouble, connect your XT60 power connector to a LiPo battery. If all is well, then you should hear the flight controller beep and see the LED screen light up. If so, congrats! In the next segment of Project Alien X, we're going to set up your receiver, tune your flight controller, set motor rotation, square up the center of gravity, and get you ready for air. You We've got to fly me, Brian. <laughs> Just you waving that at me for like the last 30 me. seconds. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, uh, in the next episode, we're actually going to show you some of the, the finishing out steps because mm -hmm. you do have to calibrate and set up the uh, the flight controller. You will have to balance the craft. Hopefully, you've already balanced your props as we told you how to do two weeks ago. I just um, want to fly, Padre. I know, right? I know, but but this building is actually okay. It's me, part of the fun. Kind of fun. I know. That's I, why I let you I do that, and then you let me together. crash them. You get to build them again. Ah, that's kind of true. <laughs> that's why we're a good team. Oh. I break them, you build them. Yes, yes. And now, but look, let's let's get away from quadcopters from a bit because uh, we will have plenty more because next week you're going to have to learn how to set the center of gravity of these crafts because mm. as we get bigger and bigger, that becomes far more important. And, and actually, we did have a question about that. People were wondering how important balancing your quad is. It's incredibly important. The yeah. problem is if you have one side of the craft that is heavier than the other, the flight controller is going to do what it has to do in order to balance it. In other words, it's going to increase the thrust on the side that's low and perhaps de decrease thrust on the side that's high. The problem is, now that even though it looks level, your quad is actually using more of its power up front, which means that when you do want to use it, you don't have much range left. Right, and I've noticed when trying to do certain maneuvers, if I'm coming down at a certain speed or something, or trying to go up at a certain speed, it definitely affects the handling of the quad if it isn't balanced. Yeah, you just you just feel it. Like it won't it won't go as fast forward as it does back, mm -hmm. or it won't go as quickly to the left or to the right. The more balanced your craft is, the more power you leave in reserve for when you actually want to, you know, punch it and make it do fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, by the way, I, I can't remember who, we'll, we'll bring it up next time, but someone did in the Google Plus group say that he landed his 250 in a pond. I'm very <gasps> sorry. I know. Oh. That's like my nightmare scenario. Um, <laughs> I fly over water because it looks beautiful, but, you know, I know if it goes in, that it's gone. I, That's I, the end I of it. I ain't getting it back. Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, so, I'm sorry. Mm. I'm sorry. We'll, we'll... I mean, if you're going to be flying... Wishes. If you're... Constantly going to be flying in an area over water, it might be a good idea. Can you get a frame that will cover most of everything? <laughs> uh, we, we I think actually, there is a quad that you we, can fly off your sailboat or something like that. We do have an episode, I think it's like two and a half months from now, where I'm going to show people how to waterproof and pontoon their quad. So if you do want to <laughs> fly off of water, you can do it. Yeah. I just just I, be prepared. Just be prepared. Yeah. Be prepared. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now we do have another question here about networking. Uh, Brian, you want to take that one? All right. This comes from Benjamin Frost, and he wants servers without hackers. If I want to run a server on one of my computers, what is the best way to secure it and make sure hackers can't get to the rest of my network if they hack that server? Uh, or would it be better to ha be having it on another internet connection? Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, this is actually, this is a very good question. Thank you very much for asking this, Benjamin. Uh, he wants to know if, like, if he wants to run a server at home, and mm -hmm. it could be any server, yeah. a game server, file server, whatever it's going to be. If he allows people to access that server, what would happen if that server got compromised? Right. Well, the short answer is everything. Everything bad would happen. Uh, if you have the server in the same segment as everything else, if that server gets compromised and that server can see everything else, 
the bad things can happen to everything else that's on the same network segment. Would this be kind of like what we were talking about earlier? Would this be something you'd keep on a different yes, NAT? Yes, yes. So so, different NAT or more, more, uh, more better, because I'm English <laughs> more my so. words, I'm using them. Um, <laughs> better would be to put it in its own VLAN. Okay. So you have, a, you have a VLAN that is set up so that only the devices connect to, to that port, which would be the server, right. can connect. Uh, they can only then connect to the internet. They can't see anything else on the rest of the network, hmm. and the rest of the network can't see it. Okay. That's what if you're at home and you want to access the server? Well, no. Th then, then you just you you're like going out to the internet and coming back. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. uh, okay. Yeah. I, I, or actually, what you're doing is you're going out to the edge of the router and then coming back. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Yeah. It, it's it's not that big of a problem, and it's also far more secure. I I, I am paranoid about running a server inside of my production network mm. because by definition I'm allowing people to access it. Right. And if I'm allowing people to access it, it means things can happen to it that I don't anticipate. And I don't like having anything in my core network that has things that I'm not anticipating. Right. And you'd have to port forward to the server and maybe... Yeah, let's, don't... <laughs> let's talk a little bit about that. Because I remember there was this one guy. I don't, He uh -huh. wanted to play games. Yeah. So yeah. he thought, you know what, the best way for him to be able to play games on his right. PC would just to be set the, the DMZ yeah. to, to the IP address of his PC. That way you've just got free access to everything. There's nothing holding you back. Yeah, and also nothing holding them back from oh. asking. Yeah, yeah, here's, okay, <laughs> d refer back to our NAT, our NAT discussion. Remember, mm -hmm. a NAT allows you to take one routable, real-world address and share it among a bunch of non-routable addresses, correct? Correct. And one of the advantages of that is something on the outside can't actually see something on the inside. Uh -huh. Unless you open up a DMZ. If you open up a DMZ, you're, you're basically saying everything, all the traffic that hits that, non, that routable address goes to one specific non-routable address on the inside, which is essentially the same thing as taking your computer, throwing away the firewall, and plugging it into the internet and saying, hey, <laughs> I'm come, here. Come I'm own here. me. Come own me. And DMZ stands for what you think it might. Right? A demilitarized zone. Right? <laughs> okay, it's, so nothing protected. It's nothing protected. It's, it's okay. just, just go, go, go. Uh, now, that is that used to be useful in the days of the old internet when people mm -hmm. were very um, ignorant of some of the threats that were out there. They were just naive. Yeah, yeah. I, never, no. never, Not ever, now? ever use a DMZ. The only time I would suggest using a DMZ is if you're doing something inside your network, like natting a NAT. I could actually take the DMZ and assign it to the WAN address of one of the other NATs uh -huh. inside my network, and then I give that the ability to do cool things. Okay. But I would never take the DMZ and throw it on a particular device. That's just, just <laughs> no. Could we could no. we run a test sometime where we have a computer on the DMZ and just see how long it I, takes to get compromised? I can act, yes, we can do that. Uh, and <laughs> believe it or not, like if you run a Windows XP machine, yeah. clean and clear, like fresh installation on the open internet, which we can do here. We, we'd have to turn off a bunch of stuff because we're actually pretty well protected. Uh, I would, within five minutes, it would get on. <laughs> just, there, there's just scripts that are running constantly. Within five minutes, something would happen to it, and uh -huh. that, now and then it would just start building up the infections. Is the DMZ something you have to be concerned about if you, if you use it on a console? I, or use it at all on anything in your anything, home network? Anything. It's just don't... Yeah, because remember, what a DMC is allowing you to do, it's allowing you to take all the ports, all the ports, oh, 65,536 possible uh. ports, <laughs> and they can all access that one device. Now, an issue with a lot of older Windows boxes is they know well enough to block certain ports, but they leave a lot of other ports open by default, even if mm -hmm. there's, they shouldn't be. And so what, what I would do if I was running an exploit, I would be looking for those open ports. And once I get one that's not properly protected, I can now own the machine. Hmm. It's and that's when you can uh, insert anything. malicious yeah, I own it. files and things like that. Literally owning it means owning it. Like I can pivot the machine so it's as if I'm sitting at the keyboard. Ah, scary. Scary. <laughs> now we have addressed a better way to do this. If you look in episode 101 of Know How, mm -hmm. we actually did port cool. forwarding. And port forwarding, remember we did this with the cameras, right? We wanted a way to access multiple cameras. Lots of cameras. Right. We could access up to 65,535 different cameras on our one uh, routable address. Well, we could use the same thing for that server. If that server is, say, an FTP server, I know that's port 21. Mm -hmm. And so I would only forward port 21 to the server, uh, and all the other ports would be shut down. Or if, if I knew that like my gaming server is on port 2100, I would forward just port 2100. So right. again, if you want to know how to do that, go to Know How, Episode 101. 
which is kind of great, right? 101. 101. <laughs> uh, and uh, you'll figure it all out. We were so young back then. We were, right? A long time ago. <sighs> Look at us. Look at that. We're just kids. Spraying myself with... <laughs> stuff. Oh, yeah, I remember that. You spray, you, oh, no. Oh, oh, oh God, no. That was terrible. Yeah. Well, you had a lot of hot spots. All right, remember, this was Predator Cam. Only sees thermal Wait. energy. We could Wait. turn off all the lights. Oh, just, right into the mic. Oh, my God. <laughs> Happy face. You hear something, Bobby? You know, I, this so makes me realize we, we should never be given toys. No. no. <laughs> if it bleeds, we could kill it. Oh, God. We have way too many. It's too much fun on some of these shows. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that about wraps it up. It. It's been about 50 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> wait, wait. One last thing. This mm -hmm. this is not a segment. Uh, this is just a really quick preview. Uh, now, people have been asking mm -hmm. when we're going to start doing 3D printed objects <gasps> on the You've show. You've got a few of them right here. Uh, yeah. We can't show it to you yet because the 3D printer we have has not actually been released. It won't be released for another month. So in a month, we are starting to, we're going to be going crazy on printing of 3D uh, through objects. Now, it's not just these really cool shapes. This is, by the way, this is really, really nice. But it's things that will help us in the other projects that we're doing. For example, uh, I decided I wanted to start building a retractable landing system for some of my quadcopters. So I came up with just a quick mock-up. This is just a servo attached to uh, a little a strut, and what happens is when I activate the servo, it allows me to extend and uh, retract a landing <laughs> gear. Now, this is a super crude initial go. This is basically just me not sleeping and saying I'm yeah. going to design this, this thing. This is you coming up with uh, some clamps. The clamps. <laughs> yeah, but with some clamps because I wanted to put uh, I wanted to put claws in the quadcopter. Because um, <laughs> who hasn't wanted to do that yeah. before? A uh, tricopter. I, I've made a little tricopter mount, so this. This, the bottom, the base is, is solid. My design for the, the upper uh, plate did, did not, mm. no. It looks a little hairy. Yeah, that, that kind of imploded on, in the printer. So, but when this is done, this will, this will allow me to tilt my motor back and forth so I can actually have a quadcopter. Now, the, the cool, uh, tri tricopter, tri sorry. The cool thing about this is I have designed it so that it can take standard aluminum and wooden dowels uh, so and it feels pretty solid. It's actually really solid, right? Yeah. Uh, this is a lot stronger than I thought it would be. It's cool. I'm looking yeah. forward to playing yeah. with this stuff. Uh, however, this did allow us to create some some objects mm -hmm. that uh, would address another question that some people in the, the Google Plus group had. They asked about angled arms and what the angled arms on quadcopters are all about. Hmm. Great question. Now, when you have a standard quadcopter, here's a 250 that, that so many of us have built. And crash into ponds. And crash into ponds and pools. There's been a <laughs> lot of crashes. By the way, send us in your crash footage. It's awesome. Yes. Seriously. Crashing is learning, and a lot of you are learning a lot. But <coughs> over and over. Me. The way that we move a quadcopter, remember, we reduce power on the motors in the direction we want to move, and we increase power on the motors away from it. So if I wanted this to go forward, I would dip it like this, and now these motors are basically pulling me forward. Right. Right. Problem with this, if you've flown quadcopters, is when you do that, you, you lose, lose a little bit of control. You lose altitude pretty quickly. And you quickly. lose altitude, right. You have to increase thrust to, because you're falling. Remember, you're falling. And it, it can make going around hairpin corners a little bit tricky. Mm -hmm. What we've been able to do is you tilt the motors inward. What tilting the motors inward does is twofold. First, if any of you have ever tried to go straight down, you're going to notice how it kind of wobbles. Yes. And that's because all the thrust is going straight down and you're flying into the, the, the turbulent air you yeah. just created, right? If you angle the motors so that they're all facing a little bit inwards, the thrust is going at an angle away from the craft and you're actually flying down into cleaner air. Yeah, it gives you a little bit of a cushion. It gives you a cushion and it, it allows you to get more steady shots. Now, check this out. This is the 250 frame that we've been using. So yeah, they look like totally normal flat. frames, right. but they're... This is a 250 frame that you can also get from, from Hobby King. Notice how it's got a little bit of an angle to it. Yeah. And what that angle will do is it will allow you to use larger props. I can use full six-inch props on this, but it gives you a natural dihedral <laughs> so that I could take all of the components from this craft, put it on this board, and now it's going to fly like a different craft. And this is what I really like. When I'm going forward, so I tilt forward, so that these motors are up to pull me forward, but the motors here are no longer pointing kind of down. At an angle, they're flat. They're flat, which means I'm not going to lose altitude as I'm going through those curves. That's cool. I want to play with that. Yeah, this is nice. But I bring this up only because the other night I was sitting at my desk, and I'm like, you know what? 
I want to I want to give the audience a way to retrofit their craft mm -hmm. without having to buy a brand new frame and move everything over. So I came up with these. I 3D printed this on uh, on our not yet existent printer. These are just little here. Here, let me give you a couple here. Yeah, let me play with these. These are just little standoffs, and they're angled. And they go under the motors on top of the motor mounts. And what they'll do is they, they will actually angle the motors about 10 degrees so you get s most of the same effect that you would from a frame with dihedral. Uh, and the cool thing about this is I think a total cost on something like this is like 10 cents. Right. What, what I want to do is actually when, once we get the, the 3D printers up and running, I just want to print out a bunch of these and just send them to anyone in the audience who, yeah. who, who wants to play with dihedral. Yeah, just mass produce these. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and the nice thing is you can retrofit your old craft and it will feel like an entirely different craft. It feels much <laughs> more aggressive. You do lose a little bit of flight time because the, end, the motors are like kind of at, at odds with each other, but, hmm. but it just makes it a much more fun ride. Cool. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty neat. It's like adding uh, a sus different suspension to your to your car yeah, or something right? like that. Yeah. Just, it's, you just always want to be tinkering You're with it. Modding it, yeah. yeah. Now, next week, we are going to be continuing with the quadcopter build. We're going to finish it out and let you get it into the air. Uh, we've also got, a, a, well, of course, we've got our special on VLAN. So I'm going to show you how to actually VLAN off your, your network if you have a DDRD, DDWRT compatible router. Mm -hmm. And uh, Brian, I think you've got a segment on uh, smartwatches. That's right. You know, the Apple Watch is coming out soon. Uh, I've been using the Moto 360 pretty religiously since I first got it. And uh, But I thought maybe people would want to play with a do-it-yourself watch. Yes. That is much cheaper. We like DIY. <laughs> now, folks, we know that this has been a lot of material. And believe it or not, we've got some great notes for you, including step-by-step -step instructions. I literally wrote up all the instructions for assembling Project Alien X. So if you if you watch that video and you were a little bit lost, watch the video along with the instructions and it should guide you through each and every single step along the way. Yep. Uh, we've also got notes for where you can buy various parts where you could go to check out the database for DDWRT compatible routers. So that's just a, a really nice resource to have. Brian, where do they go to find that? Ah, they can find it at twit.tv slash kh. And uh, like we pointed out earlier in episode 101, you can go back and uh, flip through that because that's where all our old episodes live. Uh, there's also handy links for subscribing and uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was like, yeah, you got drilled last I, week. Yeah, <laughs> I kind of did. Anthony was a little upset with you. He was, look at that. Oh. Uh, but yeah, Padre's been doing a good job with all his step-by-step -step notes and you can find all the links that you need to buy things uh, along with, I think you put the prices and stuff like that. Price is too. right. So. Damn. Yeah, uh, but that's not the only place you can find our stuff. No, you can find us on Google+. Plus. In fact, that's where I, I insist you go. It's mm -hmm. an 8,000 plus member strong group uh, just go to Google Plus and look for know-how it's not just quadcopters we've got a quite a few networking uh, 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 geeks in there we've got a couple of people mm -hmm. who are suggesting Raspberry Pi and Arduino projects jump in that group is really the way that we figure out what you want to see on the show oh now do us a favor don't just get in there and say I hate everything <laughs> that really doesn't help no. suggest projects that you actually want to see on the show and yeah. if we can do them we'll do them Yep, yep. If yeah. you think we've been talking about something for too much, that's fine. But uh, at least give us a suggestion of something else you'd like to see. Absolutely. Uh, no, don't forget that uh, G Plus isn't the only place to find us. You can find us on the Twitters. Mm -hmm. I'm at twitter.com slash Padre SJ. That's at Padre SJ. And I am at cranky underscore hippo. That's right. Follow us and you can find out what we're doing for every week of the show as well as suggest topics for future shows and see what we're doing just in general. All kinds of shenanigans. shenanigans. And uh, speaking of Twitter, at Anel3. I think we're out of time, Brian. Well, oh, we're, we're, we gotta go. Whoa, we're out of time. Whoa, 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 whoa. Somebody convinced me to put Windows 10 Preview on my gaming PC downstairs last night. First thing that happened when I got to it this morning, froze. Oh. But I think it's okay now. I think it just needed a good reboot. Just needed time. Yeah. Needed, you know, but probably. we'll see how it goes. We might do some Windows tips or something yeah. in some coming episodes. Give him some love, folks. He gets to sit in that chair. He's grumpy the whole day. <laughs> and, and he makes our lives miserable. We're, so. we're, we're really out of time. We got <sighs> time to stand by for the next oh, show, geez, Padre. Fine, whatever. Wow. Well, yeah, we are really over. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas, sir. And I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how, go do it. Flip the table. And on that bombshell, <laughs> Jeremy Clarkson is fine.